I know, I know. The idea of a Paw Patrol trans episode seems wild, completely out of the blue on you. But the actual truth of what I am talking about today with this franchise is far, far weirder than that. Far weirder than how I can't draw animals. Seriously, look at these abominations. A few of you probably just want me to confirm right now whether this is a real trans episode or just one where, I don't know, a male dog puts on a dress or something like that. And yes, okay, this is a canonical trans episode, so you can unbunch those knickers and get the hell off my back. Anyway. What is Paw Patrol about for those people who might be tuning in and over the age of 20 slash below the age of 35? A group of people who probably were not looking into this young kid's Nickelodeon show or had kids who were watching it. Well, Paw Patrol is the tale of a boy named Ryder in Adventure Bay who forms the aforementioned group with his six dogs, Chase, Marshall, Sky, Rocky, Zuma, and Rubble all of whom get equipped with special gear that aligns with their chosen field of interest. Like Sky, who operates a helicopter and rescues people with airlifting. Or Zuma, who uses a hovercraft and a submarine to save those in the water. Or Rocky, who collects stuff that needs to be recycled. Rocky is a six-year-old mixed-breed recycling pup whose pup house transforms into his trusty recycling truck. Okay, look, not all the dogs had winning career choices with regards to the badass technology that they get to use. Some of them just get a recycling truck, and that's fine, all right? Look, he had some pretty cool looking gear in the Paw Patrol Mighty movie, which ended up becoming his main seasonal gear in season 10, but you know what? Rocky is doing a hell of a lot better than one of these dogs, looking at you Chase, you damn cop with your cop car. Yeah, like that. Great job. Now, just push this button here and whoa! Nice shot. Seriously, we don't have to go in depth here on that most dreaded of pop culture topics for any series that has police officers in it, the propaganda aspect that many shows end up feeling embarrassed by and doing some awkward turnabout in their final seasons, a la Lucifer and Brooklyn Nine-Nine. But Paw Patrol rests very strongly on a simplistic and heroic interpretation of policing through Chase, presenting him as the serious, stoic, adult dog of the group, who is reliable and who you should go to if you have a problem. Look, I'm not asking for Paw Patrol to do an ACAB episode, where Chase learns that wearing the same outfit that many human police officers do gets him trapped with suspicion by certain groups of minorities, and then seeing why that suspicion exists by being on scene when racial profiling occurs, or watching as a police officer lies on, well, anything that they do, media, testimonies, whatever. But it would certainly be interesting to see how a writer could pull such a plot line off here. Kids do need to learn that police are not these infallible pillars of society that they can always trust. Because some of those kids, honestly, most of those kids, are gonna deal with harassment and violence and issues with the police. Also, I discovered from doing some digging that Chase is one of the group who doesn't believe in the supernatural stuff the Paw Patrol encounters, and takes a lot of time to convince when wacky shit goes down, which led me to wanting to find out what the hell kind of supernatural episodes of Paw Patrol there were, and that brought me to the time that a mer moon occurred and turned some of the Paw Patrol into mer pups, or that time a meteor crashed into Adventure City and turned the Paw Patrol into super pups, or that time that the Paw Patrol go to the Barkingburg Castle as part of the Barkingburg Royalty Arc to investigate ghosts, only to get caught up in an attempted coup by Sweetie, a member of the royal family who uses her robotic toy frog Busby to enact a devious plan. Really? Powerful enough to say, make someone queen? Someone like you, sweetie? Regardless, it's time for me to pull a switcheroo on you here, because when I said this was a wacky trans episode, the first part of that wackiness was that this is not even in Paw Patrol. That's right, I kinda tricked you a little bit. 
See, it's in the Paw Patrol universe, but it's in the spin-off series Rubble and Crew, featuring Rubble, the construction dog, and his family, who all get kitted out in gear and get vehicles despite the fact that they are clearly mostly puppies and therefore should probably not be operating heavy machinery. I learned that one from my time working retail in Bunnings Warehouse. Lowest prices are just the beginning. Ugh, God, the programming will never go away. That's right, we are actually talking about one of the main characters' side gigs in Builder Cove, their own little town that they basically run like a mob family, because they build whatever they want, whenever they want, and nobody gets to stop them or tell them no. Zoning laws and council approval be damned. These dogs will put up a bunch of random ass, ugly buildings that probably are not up to code, and who is gonna stop them? The last person who did got their legs smashed by Motor's wrecking ball and buried under six feet of concrete by Mix, the master chemist of the rubble crew. Do you think she makes meth? Like, Walter White? It's your funeral if you ask too many questions. The other members are Grandpa Gravel, whose main job is giving the pups snacks and chilling in the background. Auntie Crane, who supplies them with gear and goods to do the projects, and also chills in the background. Charger, who doesn't have any specific specialization apart from lifting things, and seems to mostly just be there to keep up company morale. Time for a little tree removal! Rubble, are you ready? The cafe is destroyed! It'll be okay, Mr. Porter. And Wheeler! Who gets to clean things up after the others have had their fun? What a shit job. There are, of course, a million other characters, but by god, I just hit a thousand words in this part alone already, so I reckon we can just forget about talking through all of those and finally do that trans episode that I promised you. So let's do that with season one's episode 17a. The crew builds an observatory. Though they kind of build a bad observatory, frankly, and no, no, no. Save it for the end, Simpson. Don't get into it now. Start the intro music. Anyway, the episode begins with the dogs all coming together to figure out what horrific edifice to the complete control of the town they're going to do today. Literally, they haven't even got a reason for it. It's just, oh. What do we feel like doing today? Surely there should be some kind of project manager who gives us tasks that would specifically benefit the town and its people, but, well, we know what happened to the last city official whose job it was to keep us pups in line. Old Grandpa Gravel left them floating at the bottom of Builder Bay with two gravel bricks tied around their legs. And... Then suddenly this random character skates onto the scene with badass music playing to indicate how cool they are, cause they skateboard. Is skating still a cool kid thing to do? Has, has that identity maintained itself over the past two decades since I was an impressionable child who tried to learn how to skate before discovering that my innate lack of balance pretty much crushed that dream and meant I would never be a skater boy? Doi, Evil of me would never fall in love with me! But this actual skater kid, who I guess is just cooler than me, gets a whole ass pan up scene before they see the pups and the frankly crazy awesome looking construction gear, and swivels on in while saying, gotta get that pick, like an NPC. And trust me, you're gonna hear, gotta get that pick, an awful lot before this episode is over. Whoa. Oh, gotta get that pick. Seriously, as an autistic person myself, I can always identify with these characters in children's shows, because the way they write them as effectively only having one or two personality traits that becomes everything they are, sort of ends up looking a lot like the kind of hyperfixation that I know I deal with pretty hard. Like how I used to, and still do, and probably will continue to take a single bloody thing and make it my everything for a period of time. 
It's how I managed to make a 10-hour Harry Potter video about stuff in the franchise that nobody else bothered talking about because why the hell would they? Or how I have spent over 5,660 hours playing only Europa Universalis 4. Am I saying that all children's show characters can be headcanoned as autistic if you want? Yes, the skater kid is introduced as River, who just moved into town with her family, and I guess doesn't know the situation with these pups yet? And they all seem to be getting along pretty fine. River tells the dogs how they've been skating around the town, taking pictures of all the cool buildings that definitely don't meet zoning or coding laws the pups have put up over the past 16 episodes. And yes, you might be able to guess that River's entire identity at this point is skating and camera. I've been skating around all day, snapping pics of the amazing buildings here. How did you possibly figure that one out? Was it the skateboard shirt? The fact that they keep talking about taking pictures and saying, gotta get that pic? In response to River hyping up the cool looking buildings, one of which is a popcorn cafe shaped like popcorn. And who the fuck would open up a popcorn cafe? Popcorn is not a sufficient food on which to base an entire business. You gotta do something else alongside it, right? Actually, I'm gonna quickly just check something. Okay, yeah. Popcorn Cafe links to nothing except for the episode of Paw Patrol slash Rubble and Crew where they build that. I'm not being stupid here and missing some hip trend with the kids. But in response to River talking about this, Charger, the big, not so intelligent guy, has a moment that would seem bragging on anyone else where he realizes that they've built all those buildings. These pups are the ones with the awesome builder skills River is talking about. Yeah, they must. Oh, wait, they're us. Jeez, buddy. Are you doing okay? You were literally involved in building those things a couple of weeks ago. It's worrying you've forgotten already. Then River presents to us why they are here in the episode. It's to give the pups the inspiration for the week and show them an observatory that River wants to get built which is the title of the episode. River wants it built because they want to get a picture of a shooting star that they whiffed the last time because it was too far away. And so an observatory would help them get that pick. And the pups all commit to helping River build that observatory up on, uh, I don't know, uh, that mountain over there, why not? There probably isn't any native wildlife who would be freaked out or hurt by the construction in their home going on. And, well, I mean, River is now a friend of the family, if you get my drift. They're in tight with the puppy mob, and so they can do anything. <laughs> you do that for me? You bet. Anything for our new friend. And before we can move on to the next scene, I have to quickly talk about something that upset me the entire time I was watching this episode, which is the wagging tails. I get it. They are dogs. Tails wag. Butts wag, that happens. I've owned dogs in the past, but the way it's animated and it happens while they're talking like people is just some uncanny valley level shit that sets off my us just ain't right hackles. Bingo! There's a special shooting star that's blasting right by you. <laughs> do that for me? The dogs have a person on call who can just get them a telescope for an observatory ASAP, which I guess it's just more of that power of the canine mafia. And then they have the dogs talk openly about their tails wagging when they eat treats and showing off their butts. Please, please stop, Paw Patrol. Please stop doing this. I don't want to think about it. So good. Makes my tail wag. <laughs> when the dogs go to get all the gear up the mountain, they discover that there is no road up to the top, unfortunately because I guess the construction is all focused on building silly buildings rather than, oh, I don't know, the necessary infrastructure to sustain those buildings. But thankfully, the dogs work out an alternative option of just driving up the stream that runs to the top of the mountain. River and Rubble call this a smart idea, but honestly, a smarter idea is to just build that road because when you have to inevitably do repairs or maintenance on the observatory, or maybe, 
I don't know, people want to go and visit it, it is helpful for there to be a direct way to get to it, which doesn't require tramping through bush or having a good enough vehicle that you can drive up a river. Like, I get it. It's a kid show. But we can still teach kids about the importance of future-proofing projects and infrastructure construction, all right? The camera then does a really awkward pan and a musical sting to the observatory materials on the ground while all the dogs are driving up the river. Which I thought was going to lead to a scene wherein all the dogs were like, Oh no, we forgot the very thing we were going to build. Oh, how could we be so silly? But instead, they just sing a version of Row, Row, Row Your Boat, and it cuts to the top of the mountain, and everything's fine. Well, everything's not fine, but they intentionally left the gear behind while they scouted the mountain. And now they need to move fast, because the real threat this episode is the fact that it's cold up the mountain. And it's only going to get colder as night approaches. They might even get stuck up there and have to eat river or something, unfortunately. Back down to get the telescope. Yeah, it's getting cold up here. Wheeler then makes a joke about them turning into popsicles. A joke which gets a rousing laugh from everybody, because, I don't know, it would probably crush Wheeler's spirit if nobody laughed at his jokes. And Charger then repeats the joke and breaks it down in a way that makes it clear to me now that his job is explaining things to the kids in the audience who are perceived to be unable to keep up with anything that happens in this show and don't understand what the hell is going on here. Popsicles! Like, popsicles cause we're pups! It's a rough time for his character because that is the job that is going to make you kind of look like the idiot of the group, but is a necessary one for the younger kids who might not get that joke or understand any of the stuff that gets mentioned. They build the observatory base, things get even chillier, River drops this funny line about how the pups have serious builder skills while doing some rad arm movements to emphasize their skater cred. You pups really do have serious builder skills. And they go back down to grab the telescope itself. Unfortunately, when they hit the bottom, the entire river freezes up instantaneously like Frozone just hit the scene, and Rubble, Wheeler and Charger realise that they won't be able to get up the mountain again because I guess they don't have ice treads for their trucks. Probably should invest in those, that's a good investment if you work with cold environments often. River commits to just giving straight up at this first sight of trouble, saying, oh well, won't get that pick this time I guess, and Rubble tells River that they clearly don't know the pup mob that well. This mob don't give up at all when they're committed to finishing a job. Thanks for trying, pups. River, there's something you gotta know about Rubble and crew. We never give up. Also, a few of the dogs are still stuck up that mountain, so maybe figure out a way to get them down so they are not, like, left at the top and turn into a Paw Patrol rescue episode in the future. As Rubble says, they never give up. Because there is always a construction solution. And, oh buddy, I don't think there is a construction solution to everything, but I love the optimism. Rubble, how are you going to solve the Israel-Palestine conflict? Uh, construction? Rubble calls Motor to drive down the frozen stream with her wrecking ball. And she does, absolutely smashing it to shit while spinning wildly and screaming boom, boom, more boom. Which is horrifying, honestly. This, this child should not be operating this. We need her to go boom! She does successfully wreck the ice. River gets that pick of motor wildly breaking every safety regulation I can think of, while the other pups cheer at this destruction, cause, I don't know, you put a bunch of kids in charge of shit like this, maybe following guidelines and procedure goes right out the window. They build an open air observatory, which I really don't rate, I mean, 
Telescopes like the one here are very expensive and finicky, and you normally want to protect them against the kind of elements that can exist at the top of a mountain like the one they built it on. I don't think some railing around it's going to cut it, but at least they did put the railing in there. So one OSHA guideline wasn't ignored. River gets that pick, thanks the dogs for their help in making River's dream come true. They're all good friends now, and then they do the wiggle and wave. What's the wiggle and wave, you might be rightfully asking? Oh, well, 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 when the pups do a job, they have a chant about what they did, while doing a little jumping and boogieing around, like a, a victory dance of some kind. We built an observatory! Rumble and crew! And it's Puptastic! And that's the episode. Now, keen-eyed viewers amongst you might be at this point getting your pitchforks ready in the comments, because none of that was transgender, right? God damn it. It was just a regular ass episode. And I can understand your confusion, but holster them their torches for two seconds and let me explain myself. See, this wasn't a trans-centric episode. It wasn't an episode that was about trans issues or trans lives or whatever, because that wouldn't really fit the formula, honestly. Rubble said that there is always a construction solution, but you can't construction solution away transphobic bigotry, alas. However, it was a trans episode, in the sense that River is canonically written and expressed by the show as a non-binary person which some of you might have guessed if you were playing the wait a minute, gender is this river character supposed to be transitioning to or from because I've been told it's a transgender episode and this is the only person here, so what's their deal? And as a non-binary person myself, it is very important to see these kinds of characters put into kids shows and to especially see them presented like any other child. Even, in fact, one of the cool kids that children watching might see and go, Oh, they look awesome. I want to be like them, skating and taking pictures. Because what this does is it fills a niche that often doesn't get the time or space that it deserves, even amongst transgender representation. I mean, obviously, firstly, it is beneficial for trans people to exist at all in children's media because of the fact that there are parents out there, or schools, or governments, that will not be giving those children who are watching any information about trans people while they grow up, that will be withholding all of that stuff. And so anything that connects with that identity is something that can be useful for encouraging education. Oftentimes, this gets restricted in children's media because LGBTQ representation is viewed as inherently sexual, and therefore not child safe, which is not even close to an accurate description of the vast ways in which someone's sexuality or gender identity are part of who they are. Teaching a six-year-old about sexuality, I mean, this should be common sense. And as well is really part of a cis-straight hypocrisy that will denounce gay or trans things as sexual while being perfectly okay with much more explicit scenes or mentions of their own identities. Or because cis and straight are viewed as normal and how things have been and not a problem for kids to see or engage in. I'm sorry, but children's shirts with chick magnet on them are a scarily common occurrence in clothing marketplaces. And that's some weird ass sexualization shit for a child to wear that no gay or trans person had a hand in. It's also important to think about how, while the show might not be teaching trans issues directly, or giving kids trans identities blatantly, like here in Paw Patrol, what it is doing is providing them a character whose coolness and presentation will hopefully either be something that the trans kids can connect to, or that will give cis kids an opportunity to see those people normalised as not weird or abnormal or sexual. It can also serve to get them thinking about that kind of stuff, and then looking it up on the internet, a very useful resource in states or countries or households where access to information about LGBTQ identities is restricted. Everyone always likes to talk about the scary and dangerous parts of the World Wide Web, 
but it also does have some beneficial functions too. Secondly though, this episode featuring a non-binary character is good for those kids in families or places that do allow them to know about trans people because it serves to expand that discussion beyond what is normally a very simplified and basic view of the trans community that children get served. By this, what I'm talking about is that trans people often get boiled down to just being trans men or trans women. That they're one of the two genders and then flip over to the other side and that's that. Something which even cis adults will also use as their only definition of us. The truth is that binary genders are not very accurate to the human experience or expression, and are generally harmful to view as inherent, and that breaking that perception to give you one that sees who we are as being more open and able to move between artificial boundaries is something that cis people could do with learning, from any age. Some people will take this and say that, well, it might confuse kids and make them all lost about who they are and, well, that's why you do the education thing. The whole explaining gender and talking it through with them and giving them more guidance on that path that lets the child come to understand themselves better over time rather than just pretending that the trans community doesn't exist or that parts of it doesn't exist at all. I mean, this is all just part of my persistent ask for more diverse and varied trans characters because of how that can be useful for both cis people getting to see that existence and also trans people who can find more places to connect with characters who are closer to how they feel about themselves. Another part of this whole episode discussion that we need to have is behind the scenes and on the other side of the audience bit we just did, which is the writers and the actors involved in the crew built an observatory. We have Si Hang Ma, a non-binary actor involved in shows like Departure and Star Trek Strange New Worlds voicing River, as well as Linz or Lindsay Amare or Queer Mr. Rogers as they're known on Instagram, who hosted queer kid stuff on YouTube to help specifically educate children about LGBTQ identities in a kid-friendly manner directly, as well as one of the founders of Blue Laces, a theatre project that engages autistic children and later on autistic people of all ages, both in the audience and also by providing them with workshops to get involved on the stage as well. Whoa, they're talking about gay stuff with kids. But talking to kids about gay stuff is actually crucial. Both of these are non-binary people. And what do we see here on an episode that features a non-binary character written in a way that doesn't make their non-binary identity a problem or employ stereotypes, and in fact just presents them as another kid while also allowing them to exist as themselves? Well, we find that the creative process for that character was heavily influenced by having non-binary people involved in it. Something which you might recognise if you watch my other videos, and if you don't then, well, I say this a fucking lot, as a thing that I am constantly harping on about as being a big deal. The getting trans people in any capacity on a show will give that show the opportunity to better reflect realities and truths about the community that avoid the dangerous pitfalls of stereotype and bigotry. And lo and behold, it does happen when it happens. That's so cool. Maybe you could help me. This is great stuff because firstly, it feels like it validates everything I keep saying but also because so often it is hard to get jobs or roles as a trans person in the media industry. And so being able to have that while also having the ability to put who you are into the script or character is a fantastically pro-trans move that many other shows should be following suit on. Bet you didn't think this would be happening with Paw Patrol's franchise universe, and yet here we are. Thoughtful production, writing, and acting involvement leading to a thoughtful representation that does exactly what it needs to do for child audiences. This is kind of like Danger Force. Maybe, maybe kids media is doing all right. Transgender is an umbrella term for people whose gender identity doesn't match the body they were born into. Okay, wow, you do got this. Unfortunately, in my final point here, we do have to go into the negative for a second. 
Although, for once, we're not talking about the negative in regards to the show or movie itself or the creators or whatever. We're actually talking about the negative in regards to the backlash towards the episode that came from the right-wing side of media and parent organisations. And yes, of course, as you might have guessed, they got very, very mad about this. This episode being exactly the sort of thing that conservative groups live in fear of. Yeah, it is amazing. This selfie with my new friends. But I do think that the episode and the comparison we can make between it and the fear-mongering of places like Fox News and Steven Crowder and Trump and honestly name whoever you want to name, Rishi Sunak, Winston Peters, Tucker Carlson, Marianne Le Pen, Scott Morrison, I mean god every single bloody right-winger politician or pundit in every single bloody fucking country has been getting on the trans hate train over the past five years to be honest, regardless of how actually helpful it is for election results. But is transgender sport a defining issue for Australians, as the PM asserts? Not according to a Guardian essential poll. But what we see here from the episode really does reveal the actual justification behind all this hate and fear towards kids-oriented LGBTQ programming. It's not because of the fears that it's too sexual for young minds. It's not the fears that it's going to confuse people and upset them. It's not the fears that this is going to destroy the fabric of society and family. It's the knowledge that when people see stuff like this Paw Patrol episode, they're just going to see a really bog-standard and normal episode of the show that doesn't feature pretty much anything that makes it stand out in those ways that people would be worried about. That the trans person was on their screen and everything didn't break down or stop working. And then you compare this very tame trans representation to the reaction that it got from right-wingers and you begin to see the hypocrisy you begin to see the ridiculousness that exists at the heart of their bigotry. A bigotry that predominantly serves as a tool for those in power to maintain the systems that keep them in power. Every single time we get trans representation that normalises our identity and that gives cis people another connection to our community in which we are humanised, it dismantles the power that transphobia has just a little bit more, pushes that needle towards the positive one small step further. And that's a good thing. So yeah, that's my Paw Patrol trans episode. An episode that wasn't actually Paw Patrol technically, but kind of was technically, and was canonically a trans episode, if not a trans issues episode. I think the points that it raised for me, and arguments that spun off from it, were important enough to talk about it. And the fact that we got to see a non-binary character on a kid's show, especially a major kid's show, is always a plus in my book. And hopefully you enjoyed listening to this and learning about it. If you did, then you can like, share, subscribe, comment, or go and check out my other videos. I really appreciate it, and I think there are certainly a few good ones in my selection. I also do pass my comments for suggestions on other franchises, shows, or movies to check out, and do a video on. So drop those if you got them. If you really, really liked what I did, then you can go to my Patreon and subscribe there to help fund this channel. Those in the $5 and up category should be scrolling past the screen right now. And I really do appreciate everyone on there for their part in helping to make this an experience I can keep doing as I currently am. I have many, many, many more years of content planned that I'm really looking forward to going through, especially because I just do not see other trans content creators bothering to cover the kind of stuff that I'm doing or discuss these shows that nobody's talking about. Because surely some people connect with them or care about them, and those are interesting on the face of it to consider with regards to having anything to do with trans people whatsoever, whether canonical or not. Yet again, if you want to help cover the cost of the rent, internet, food, power, and cat tax that let me keep this channel going by, you know, living, which is certainly important because the Lily Simpson channel would be, well, non-existent without the Lily Simpson part of it, 
then going to my Patreon is a fantastic way to do that. Otherwise, thank you for watching the video, and I hope you have a great day.